Yes. So we're recording now. The purpose of one of the purposes of this talk that we're getting ready to have here is uh, get to know slavery, get to find slavery in the Constitution and in the finding, get to know with a certain amount of intimate detail, the U.S. Constitution, maybe get to know it in a certain way that other people will not get to know the Constitution. So here is a, a painting, famous painting of the Constitutional Convention, the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia here, standing above head and shoulders above the rest of the people here. That's going to be George Washington sitting here in the corner in the cut. This is the intellectual heft in the room. This is the father of the Constitution. James Madison, where George Washington is the father of the country. James Madison is the father of the Constitution. He, sitting here in a central position in this painting, in a distinguished position in this painting, is the elder statesman at the time, Benjamin Franklin. Remember that Benjamin Franklin is upwards of 70 years old when the average age of the constitutionalists were in the mid 30s, and then whispering sweet nothings of unified currency and central banking is the popular culture darling nowadays, Alexander Hamilton. So let, let's stare at this painting while I read a little something to you. I'm pulling from a book written by Edward Greensburg. This book is published initially in uh, 1963. And this book here is called, I'm gonna show you the picture here. This is called The American Political System. I am on, mm -hmm. where shall we go? Let's go here on page 57. Wait, wait, before I say this, though, remember that we are doing both the, you know, the dominant or traditional way to understand the U.S. Constitution, and then we're going to get to know the Constitution in a more, um, let's say, a more critical sense, right? Now, we want to do both. We want to engage the dominant understanding of the Constitution because you want to get to know what people say about themselves or what people who like the Constitution, what they say about it, right? Uh, your textbook is the dominant slash traditional view of the Constitution. And then what I'm bringing to you through, I, would, I was going to say in class, but, you know, here, this is class, right? So what I'm bringing to you in class is a more critical understanding of the Constitution. When you merge the two, the traditional and the critical view, the radical and the dominant view, then maybe you'll mess around and have a real understanding of what was going on, right? All right, so by way of the uh, more critical approach, I'm on page 57 of this book. I'm reading to you. The men who gathered in Philadelphia to put a lid on democratic excesses were of a particular sort. While they came from different regions of the new nation, they spoke with distinctly different accents and made their living from different lines of work. All of these men were of considerable wealth and standing. Nowhere to be found in this august gathering were ordinary mechanics, farmers, and workers. Certainly there were no indentured servants or enslaved people, and certainly there were no women. Only wealthy merchants, financiers, and planters were there. What they shared was a belief, listen to this, what they shared was a belief in the Lockean dictum that the great and chief end of men's uniting into commonwealths and putting themselves under government is the preservation of their property. Why were people why were they, you know, engaged in the writing of this constitution? To preserve their property more. The delegates knew furthermore why they had gathered in Philadelphia. The issues were transparent for all to see, while much of the time was taken up with the question of the relative powers of the states and of national governments. The essence of the debate actually lay elsewhere for the new participants. And I'm going to save this next line when we get to it in just a little bit, right? So remember that the uh, the traditional view of the writing of the Constitution, as these were philosopher kings, wise, honorable, noble people who were setting up a government for the benefit of their children and, and having motivations of freedom and liberty in their minds. And then the more critical view is to say, wait a minute, this is a gathering of the wealthiest individuals of the, of the time. And essentially what they're looking to do is protect their wealth. When you watch the other video, you're going to see 
that I was walking through the Constitution. We located the key principles of the Constitution, the four of them, and then we were pushing through the rest of this material. I think I'll do some of that with you today. But what I really want to do with you today is I'm going to open up this thing. I'm going to show you something. Uh, it's going to be a little slow here, but I want to show you a little something. I want to start off with a speech by Michelle Bachman. Michelle Bachman, stop sharing. Michelle Bachman was, she still is a darling of the conservative circles, but a few years ago, she was downright famous, right? She actually won the Iowa caucus one year when she was running for the presidency. Share, Chrome, share audio, and then here it is. Let's see if you can see that there, right? Can you see that there? All right, now, wait, wait, wait. Let me, uh, let's look at, let's listen to what Michelle Bachman said about, the, about slavery in the Constitution. That's why I say there is doubt in the minds of Americans I hope you can hear. that we will continue is this great, exceptional nation. In his first major address, Abraham Lincoln gave this expression when he said, the latest generation that fate shall permit the world to know. We have a task of gratitude to our fathers, justice to ourselves, duty to posterity, and love for mankind in general. And that requires us faithfully to perform. For 21 generations in America, we've listened to Lincoln's words. We have faithfully performed to the next generation. And our ancestors, when they arrived on these shores, just think of it, they spoke different languages. They had different cultures, different backgrounds, different traditions. But unbelievably, they all bound themselves back to this tradition, this covenant that was contained in the Mayflower Compact. This covenant that we, we republished in the Declaration of Independence. How unique in all of the world. That Remember, she just dropped, name dropped, the uh, Mayflower Compact and the Declaration of Independence. We covered some of that in a, you know, earlier talk this week. Let's keep going. In all of the world, that one nation that was the resting point from people groups all across the world. It didn't matter the color of their skin. It didn't matter their language. It didn't e matter their economic status. It didn't matter whether they descended from nobility or whether they have a higher class or a lower class. It made no difference. Once you got here, we were all the same. What? One more time, let's get the point. Class. It made no difference. Once you got here, we were all the same. We who? Keep going. Isn't that remarkable? It is absolutely remarkable. And out of that, e pluribus unum. Out of that, out of many, one. That is the greatness and essence of this nation. And we know we weren't perfect. We know there was slavery that was still tolerated when the nation began. We know that was an evil, and it was a scourge and a blot and a stain upon our history. But we also know that the very founders that wrote those documents worked tirelessly until slavery was no more in the United States. One more time. We also know that the very founders that wrote those documents worked tirelessly until slavery was no more in the United States. One more time, we just to be sure. We know that the very founders that wrote those documents worked tirelessly until slavery was no more in the United States. And I think it is high time that we recognize the contribution of our forebears who worked tirelessly. Men like John Quincy Adams, who would not rest until slavery was extinguished in the country. And we have them to thank for that. And so instead of continually going back and looking at the weaknesses and the stains of America, let's look instead at the greatness of America. And we, because we were a self correcting country. All right. So what we have here is 
a former Republican congresswoman, I forget what state she's from, Minnesota or something like that. Uh, she here is saying, stop screen share. She is saying that the founding fathers worked tirelessly until slavery was no more. Uh-huh. Did they now? Really now? Now, let me read to you something else, right? On this point. The Founding Fathers, all right, here, I'm coming from this book here. Let me put it in front of the camera. This book here is called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Might as well be said, be called Lies My Congresswoman Told Me. Lies My Teacher Told Me, written by James Lowen. I'm on page, I'm on page 146. James Lowen tells us that, okay, so, you know, she just told you something that is, we're going to say that is, you know, really incorrect, right? That the founding fathers worked tirelessly until slavery was no more or was abolished or something like that, right? Well, we can excuse her, I guess, for, you know, saying that, right? Because maybe there's a reason why people are educated to not understand that slavery is not abolished but protected in the Constitution. Okay, I'm on page 146. James Lowen's book says, textbooks play their part by minimizing slavery in the lives of the founders. As with Woodrow Wilson, Helen Keller, and Christopher Columbus, textbook authors cannot bear to reveal anything bad about our heroes. In 2003, an Illinois teacher told her sixth grade sixth graders that most presidents before Lincoln were slave owners. Her students were outraged, not with the presidents, but with her for lying to them. That's not true, they protested, or it would have been in the book. End quote. They, pro, uh, they pointed out that their textbook devoted many pages to Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Jackson, and other early presidents, pages that had said not one word about their owning slaves. And of course, this Illinois teacher wasn't wrong. Uh, in the real life, the founding fathers and their wives wrestled with slavery. Textbooks canonize Patrick Henry. Now remember, Patrick Henry. <laughs> Carter Smith is like, what did Helen Keller do? We'll get to Helen Keller. We'll talk about labor conflicts in, um, in the chapter on interest groups, right? Now, remember, we talked about him, uh, Patrick Henry because he said, is peace so dear, is uh, liberty so sweet to be purchased at the price of chains and liberty? Forbid it, almighty God. Patrick Henry said, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. All right, now. Back to the book, I'm on page 147. Not one tells us that eight months after delivering the speech, Patrick Henry ordered diligent patrols to keep Virginia slaves from accepting the British offer of freedom to those who would join their side. Patrick Henry himself wrestled with the contradiction, exclaiming, would anyone believe I am the master of slaves of my purchase? With an exclamation point on there. Uh-huh. Uh, almost no one would today because only two of the textbooks I examined, Land of Promise and The American Adventurer, you folks are fresh out of high school, I imagine. Do you have your high school textbook? You can put James Lowen's accusation to the test. Look at your American history textbook and see if what he's saying is true. I'm back in the book. I'm on page 147. Uh, none of the books I examined, Land of Promise and the American Adventure, even mentioned the inconsistency of Patrick Henry owning slaves. Henry's understanding of the discrepancy between his words and his deeds never led him to act differently to his slave sorrow. Throughout the revolutionary period, Patrick Henry added enslaved Africans or slaves to his holdings. And even at his death, unlike some other Virginia planters, he freed not a one. Nevertheless, this book here called Triumph of the American Nation quotes Henry calling slavery as repugnant to humanity as it is inconsistent with the Bible and destructive of liberty without ever mentioning that he held slaves. This book called American Adventure devotes three whole pages to Patrick Henry, constructing a fictitious melodrama in which his father worries how would he ever earn a living. This book then tells how Henry failed at storekeeping, tried to raise 
make a living by raising tobacco, started another store, had three children and a wife to support. He knew he had to make a living some way, so he decided to become a lawyer. The student who reads this chapter in this book and later learns that Henry grew wealthy from the work of, own, of owning scores of slaves has a right to feel hoodwinked. None of the new textbooks do any better. So I want us to do better, right? I want us to be clear. We want to get to know the U.S. Constitution. We want to get to know, let me advance the slide here. We want to get to know the U.S. Constitution because you are expressing your love for the country. You like being in America. Dare one even say you are patriotic and you love being in America. Well, do you match your love, your affection for this country with knowledge of what this country has going on? Do you match your affection for the country with your knowledge of the U.S. Constitution, right? Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but we're going to do it today. So let's think about, wait, wait, first, let's go into the Constitution. I did a video, I did a video a recording on this a second ago, but when you're going through the Constitution, just real quick, the Constitution is the document that is the basis of the American government. Remember, the fourth key idea of the preamble is to establish a federal government. That's what the preamble means when it says establishing this Constitution. It means that it's, that means it establishes a federal government. All right. Now, your Constitution has seven articles. The first article has the legislative branch. The second article, scrolling, the second article has the executive branch. The third article has the judicial branch. Uh-huh. Third article. The fourth article has the full faith and credit clause. I detailed all of these in the other recording. You should listen to it. I did not talk about this, but we'll talk about this later in the semester, I guess. But Article 5 looks at the amendment process, the amendment process. Article 6 of the Constitution is where you're going to find the supremacy clause. I can't highlight these things. And then Article 7 of the Constitution says in order for this uh, Constitution to be ratified, you need to have nine of the 13 states to agree to it, all right? So you have seven articles in your Constitution. Along with those seven articles, you have changes to the Constitution that take the form of amendments, and there are 27 amendments to your Constitution. And of that 27, the first 10 is called the Bill of Rights. So the structural composition of your constitution is to say that you have one preamble, seven articles, 27 amendments, the first 10 of which are called the Bill of Rights. Something else in the slides, right? What I'm pushing through for you here is that there's certain things I'd like for you to know that are in the articles, right? So, you know, we're back. We know that Article 1, Section 8 has the enumerated powers. Article 1, Section 8 has the enumerated powers. And remember, the enumerated powers are the specific, the listed powers of Congress. You see, it says literally, Congress shall have the power to, the power to borrow money, money, the power to regulate commerce and such. So when you're flipping through the slides, you'll find that the things I want you to know in the articles are sitting right there. Now, let's get back to our discussion about slavery. You will remember with me that in 1526, this is not your history class again, right? But remember with me in 1526, your uh, framers of the constitution, wrong, 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 let me get my head right. In 1526, the Portuguese established the first slave <clears throat> plantation in what's now called South Carolina. That territory or that expedition does not turn into the United States, so it's less spoken about. But the first time Africans were brought to slavery in the United States was 1526. By 1619, 20 or 21 Africans from what's now called Angola or African folks of the Mbundu people were brought in slavery to Jamestown, Virginia to Fort Comfort, ironically. And these folks here were... Um, 
brought into slavery in the territory that would grow up 150 years later and turn into the United States. Now, let's call the roll, right? Let's call the roll. How deep does slavery run in the minds of the constitutionalists? How deep does slavery go inside the U.S. Constitution? Remember, now this is something I pressed earlier today in one of those recordings, the only people that were in the uh, Constitutional Convention were wealthy white males. That is to say, you are excluding anyone who is not of their economic class. That economic class in an agrarian economy is engaging profits at some point, if not directly, from the slave trade. Uh huh. And so it makes sense then to note that the, your founding fathers, many of them, while they did have speeches where they wrote, where they spoke and wrote against slavery, where they did sign anti-slavery legislation, if they did proclaim to the to history the virtues of freedom and liberty and justice for all and inalienable rights and all men are created equal, but at the same time. Uh, Charles Wall Button, Charles Pinckney owned 250 Africans. Uh huh. That James Madison, the father of the Constitution, enslaved over a hundred Africans. That Benjamin Franklin had uh, at least two. That remember Patrick Henry, as I just read for you, he so-called struggled with the notion that he had his uh you know uh, enslaved africans even though he became known for the the speech give me liberty or give me death i have the word whippings in there because i've got a book over here written by herbert apthaker where it says that patrick henry not he just personally enjoyed a whipping recalcitrant enslaved black people. Hey, um, who's that? Uh, right? Perringer, when we talk about pulling teeth, we know that history in history that George Washington had notoriously bad teeth. We know that enslaved Africans on his plantation that he owned had their teeth taken out of their mouth, put into some kind of wooden denture, and he, you know, they would put it in their teeth, right? They would they would put the, that thing in their mouth. Now, some history books treat that kind more kind than others, right? Uh, I've got some rough history books over here. Some of that stuff said that they knocked them out. But then other history books say that the, the, the guy, the black guy whose teeth was taken, he was paid for it, that people would sell their teeth, whatever, right? Let's consider for a, a bit. We're getting ready to go back into the Constitution, but let's consider for a bit Thomas Jefferson. If you remember with me, I don't know, you know, you'll pay attention to the recording if I didn't say it to this class, but Thomas Jefferson writes the most fa one of the most famous sentences in all of American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh-huh. But over the course of his lifetime, he owned 600 enslaved Africans. And of course, of course, you can't even talk about Thomas Jefferson without talking about Sally Hemings, uh, an enslaved black woman who as a teenager, Thomas Jefferson, I'm going to use a word like, uh, what can we say? Relationship means that it was consensual. Can a, four, well, I think he was in his 40s, right? Can a 40 year old have a consensual relationship with a teenager? Can a 40-year-old have a consensual relationship with a teenager that he owns? One more. Can a 40-year-old have a consensual relationship with a teenager that he owns and that he owns her mother? Mm -hmm. Now, it depends on the book that you're reading. Oh, wait, I got to show you this other picture. I hope I can find it. That uh, it depends on the book that you're reading, whether or not, you, you know, the author of that book is going to say, oh, Thomas Jefferson was a man of his times. Oh, you know, he loved her. That's why he kept her around for years and years and such. OK, I can't find it. I can't find it. I can't find it. I think I can't find it right now. So I'm going to keep on going. But in your textbook, I've wait. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, 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 wait. I think I got it. Okay, so your textbook on page 13, you can look at it, is a book of the descendants of Thomas Jefferson. Here's the picture. I'm showing it on, on the camera. This is a picture of the descendants of Thomas Jefferson, 
right? One of these people was a student at Kennesaw State. He was in my class, right? And we had great fun. He was a decent enough guy. He was, you know, a white guy, right? But he was a, well, he was married at least to a descendant of Thomas Jefferson. He would go to Monticello for all the, you know, all the festivities and such. And he and I would, I think he was actually older than me at the time. So we would kick it a little bit and talk about, you know, Sally Hemings and the hypocrisy of it all. Let me give you this right here. Then we'll keep on going. Let me give you this right here. In this book, right, Lies My Teacher Told Me on page 147, your te this textbook author says that recent textbooks do not really mention that Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. And if they do mention it, they always mention it in the subordinate clause. I'm reading the book. Here is this particular book's entire treatment. Despite his elite background and ownership of slaves, he was a strong ally of the small farmer and average citizen. Another book says he had proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal, but he was a slaveholder. Another book says grants six words to Jefferson's complicity with the institution. They follow poor they follow four paragraphs of praise about him, including his opposition to the practice. And then a, a yet another book says that Thomas Jefferson remains a puzzle for historians. The author of some of the most eloquent words ever written about human freedom was himself the owner of slaves. Actually, by 1820, Jefferson had become an advocate for the ad, uh, expansion of slavery to the Western territories. He was never ambivalent about slavery, how it affected his private life. Jefferson was an average owner who had his slave whipped and sold into the deep South as examples to induce other slaves to obey. By 1822, he had uh, 267 slaves and during his long life, of hundreds of different of slaves he owned, he freed only three and freed five more at his death, and all were blood relatives of his, as in were his, were his children. Lies my teacher told me, get you some of that one day. Now let me get back to the point. I wanted to say that to you because when you're doing a class in American government, you have to acknowledge, you know, the full dimensions of history. I don't know, we, I, I would be some other kind of professor if we taught, talked about slavery in the context of, rather the constitution and didn't mention slavery at all. Remember that the president of the United States, that the president of the United States just this past weekend, I feel like I should prove this, what I'm getting ready to say, that he came out and said he wanted to defund any teaching of Trump of the 1619 project in American schools. Okay. Let me give you that, right? This here, this is the first one that pulls up. So I'll show you that news article. The 1619 project literally, uh, you know, looks to educate Americans. It was funded through the New York Times, educate Americans on the history of slave trade. And then The Trump administration, T-H-E-O-R-Y, right, has said that he wants to, the Trump administration said he wants to end, pull funding from any training on critical race theory because he and his allies at Breitbart.com, Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, and those folks don't believe that there is such a thing called white privilege. So I want us to be clear about some things that where Michelle Bachman says, the founding fathers worked tirelessly until slavery was no more. I want us to say, no, that's not exactly what happened. All right, now let's go to the constitution. The, the question on the test, one of the questions on the test is probably gonna look like why, not whether or not there's slavery in the constitution, that is a given, but why is there slavery in the Constitution? Let's find a few instances and then we'll talk about it. Remember we earlier said that the great compromise of the Constitution has two parts. The first part is bicameralism. You find that in Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1. But the second part of the great compromise is the three-fifths clause. Here 
in Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, is the three-fifths clause. It reads, representation and taxation shall be apportioned or divided amongst the several states, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding the Indians who are not taxed three-fifths of all other persons. This is the three-fifths clause. How do we know that it is referencing slavery? The word slavery does not appear in your constitution, but it says the phrase bound to service for a term of years. And what shall happen to them? For taxation and representation purposes, they'll be called three-fifths of all other, all white, all free, of all other persons. So the three-fifths clause is a reference to slavery. This sentence does not say it's going to be abolished. It does not say you should do away with it. It says you have it, and this is how we're going to count the enslaved Africans. Let's move on. I got two more instances for you. Let's go to Article 1, Section 9. Let's go to Article 1, Section 9. Article 1, Section 9 of your U.S. Constitution says the migration or importation of such persons as the states now existing shall uh, now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to the year 1808. Remember, your Constitution is ratified in uh, 1788. 1808 is 20 years. We're going to call this a 20 year protection for slavery. Michelle Bachman, the founding fathers worked tirelessly until slavery was no more. Uh, no, they did not. In fact, the founding fathers, the people who wrote the Constitution, they put slavery in there, right? Migration of such persons, rather importation. How do you import people? You import them because they're enslaved to you. This thing is protecting slavery for at least 20 years. Right. Article one, section nine is a 20 year protection for slavery. Now, let's keep on going. Uh, let's point out Article four, section two, clause three. Article four, section two, clause three here says no person held to service or labor in one state. That means slavery under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged discharged for such service or labor, but shall be delivered up upon claim of the party to whom such labor or service may be due. We, we're going to call this Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, the Fugitive Slave Clause. The Fugitive Slave Clause. This means that if a person is on a plantation and they you know, underground railroad, follow the drinking gourd and follow the North Star and read the signs on the quilts. And they find they walk their way all the way from, let's say, a Louisiana plantation and they find themselves in freedom. And let's say that they're in Boston. The person who owns the plantation and who holds the bill of sale on them, who calls himself their master, their so-called master, he's going to hire bounty hunters. Those bounty hunters are going to track the uh, escaping black person no matter where they go, and they're going to find them in Boston. And then, you know, I don't know if you folks have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, bop them in the head and take them in chains all the way back to the plantation. So the Constitution here says that if you escape slavery, you are not understood to be free just because you escaped, right? Michelle Bachman, one more time. The founding fathers worked tirelessly until slavery was no more. No, they did not. The founding fathers protected slavery in Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 here saying that escaping does not equal freedom. All right. Okay, I see what you're saying there, Hubbard. But Hubbard, okay, I see what you're saying there, right? But let's keep in mind the case of N-O-N-E-Y-J-U-D-G-E. I want you to keep in mind the case of, we'll just go to, let's go to this radical webpage called Wikipedia. Keep in mind the case of Oni Judge. This is a black woman who escapes George Washington's plantation 
And the story of Oni Judge is that George Washington chases her mercilessly, right? That he chased, he, not he himself, right? But he hired people to chase her for essentially, I forget the amount of years because I haven't thought about this in a while, but he chased her for years. Like she, the story is she had to hide in the woods and in the swamps and whatnot, right? So I see what you put in there, but let's be clear, this slavery stuff, boy, oh boy, this is some serious business. All right, so that's me talking about slavery in the constitution. Now, the only other thing I want to mention here, uh, that was a diding. Does somebody want to say something? Perringer, do you want to comment? Should I read your comment? Um, I have a, a question. Ready. Um, why would they chase so mercilessly if they weren't seen as human? Why, why would he have the desire to go after her? Was she holding a secret or was she just useful? Did it, was it the, the pride? You know, my thought on it is, let's say you're walking down the street and then you realize, wait a minute, I don't have my cell phone. I bought that cell phone. That's my cell phone. I make a living off that cell phone, you're gonna walk around and you're gonna find that cell phone, right? No, the, clear, the quick answer, and I see some people agreeing with this, right? Yeah, he, he chased her mercilessly, right? Because he owned her. And there is a certain, okay, there's economic determinism there, but there's also a certain psychological thing around that also, right? How dare you leave? You are my property. Who knows what he was doing to her in the first place, right? All right, did that um, somewhat speak to you, to your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. All right, let's keep on going. All right, the only other thing I have to talk about here is the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Wait, I, I referenced Howard Zinn. No, 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 let's go to the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. Now, the Constitution itself is written in the year 1787. The Constitution is ratified in 1788, and the U.S. government begins operating under the Constitution in the year 1789. Between then, between 1788 and 1789, there is another rather critical debate stirring in the country. The debate is whether or not to ratify the document. Remember, the whole point of the Federalist Papers is to present a series of arguments explaining why the Constitution should be ratified by the various states. Uh, even more specific, the Federalist Papers are a series of newspaper editorials in New York that are essentially explaining why the Constitution should be ratified. It's an argument pro the Constitution. Well, there's a group of people who were hostile, who did not want the U.S. Constitution ratified. In an earlier talk today, I went through the distinction between the people who were in the Constitutional Convention and then the people who decided they did not want to go. So remember, present in the Constitutional Convention, uh, wrong button, was James Madison, George Washington, Hamilton, Franklin, Governor Morris. These people were there. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were sympathetic, but they were on diplomatic missions. But let's look at one more time who was who could have been there, who was invited probably to come, but who said, I'm not coming. Remember, Thomas Common Sense Payne, Thomas, the father of the American Revolution Payne, he didn't want to go to the Constitutional Convention, right? Samuel Boston Tea Party Adams, he said, I know what you guys are up to, and I'm not going to take part of it. Patrick, give me liberty or give me death, Henry. Patrick, uh, what's the word for it when you say one thing and do another? I forget. I'm, I'm, I lost that word. Not bigot, but what's the word? Flip flop. Wait, ah, hypocrite. That's what I'm looking for. Hypocrite, right? Patrick, hypocrite Henry, who owned slaves, extolling the virtues of freedom in his public life. He said he's not going to the Constitutional Convention. Famously, he says, I smell a rat. And then John Hancock, the person who financed in large part the American Revolution, he said he's not going to the Constitutional Convention because it was going to create a form of government where power is concentrated in the hands of a few, only a few people. So the conflict between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, we need to know a little 
little something about what was what was at issue there. So let's look at a few of their points. Now, this is what I want you to know for the test, right? The anti-federalists, I want you to clearly state that the anti-federalists, they are anti the ratification of the Constitution. To ratify means to approve. So the anti-federalists are against the Constitution. The Federalists, however, they are for the Constitution. They are pro, excuse me, ratification. This conflict between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, this encompasses some of the most famous founding fathers of American history. I just mentioned to you that some of the Anti-Federalists were people like Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, uh, John Hancock, Thomas Paine. The Federalists are people like George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, at least early in his life, right? Well, not early. Yeah, so the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, they wrote, this is what this is a picture of, right? They wrote arguments and essays against each other, like two rappers doing a battle in the newspaper, right? So what did the Federalists say? Remember, the Federalists said, Okay, the anti-federalist said any government big enough to secure the people is also big enough to abuse the people. Okay, the federalists argued that any government that's going to exist has to be big enough to keep people safe. Remember, the federalists are looking at Daniel Shea's rebellion. Uh, hey, Alexander Van Dyke, do I see your hand? You wanna you wanna jump in? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. All right. So the Federalists here, they're arguing that, you know, they want the Constitution ratified because they want a strong central government. But the anti-Federalists said, wait a minute, how are we going to protect our rights if we have this big federal government, right? The anti-Federalists thought that the states would be the safer guarantors of the rights of the people. The Federalist countered, and this is what Madison is saying in Federalist 51, and I put that video on your thingamajig. The Federalists argue that the government will be composed of separated powers in conflict with each other through a series of checks and balances, and that is why you're going to, that is how you're going to safeguard the rights of the people. The anti-Federalist counter, he said, you know what, that's not enough. We need a specific listing of the rights of the people that the government will accept as precious, right? That the Bill of Rights, we need a set of, uh, you know, we need a Bill of Rights. We need a, a list, right? Now read my thing there, right? The Federalist, in particular, Alexander Hamilton in his Federalist number 78, he argued that the listing of rights would be dangerous because if the national government were supposed to protect specific rights, then what would stop them from violating things that aren't listed, right? And so his argument is, since we can't list all the rights, then you shouldn't list any of the rights. But that wound up being a losing argument. George Washington makes a, reaches a deal and says, let's go ahead and write a Bill of Rights. Uh, James Madison writes that Bill of Rights and to deal with Alexander Hamilton's critique in Federalist Number 78, he includes the Ninth Amendment and the Ninth Amendment says, you have, I should show it to you while I'm talking about it, The Ninth Amendment here says that you have more rights than those that are in the Constitution. The Ninth Amendment says this listing of the constitutional rights are not the only ones that you have. Okay, so that's what I want you to know about the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. And uh, and with that, I think I am ready to stop talking. Yeah, I think that's I think I did a good job on that. Slavery. Federalist versus anti-federalist, why you should know your constitution. All right, so I'm going to end the recording on that.